Not a single person that I've been with when they're dying has said, bring me my trophies. I want to see my golf trophy. Bring me my diploma. I want to look at it one more time. Bring me that gold watch I got from the business I get. No, when people die, you know what they want? They want people around them. They want relationships. And eventually we always learn it's about love. You know, when I wrote the first four words, it's not about you. Honestly, you guys, I had no idea how many times I was going to be tested on that. Oh. For the rest of my life. Wow. I, sometimes I think I'm tested 50 times a day with that sentence. It's not about you. And if I hear a compliment or a praise, I go, it's not about you. And if I hear a criticism or an unfavorable attack, I go, it's not about you. Okay, this really is, I didn't have any idea I, I almost sometimes wish I hadn't put that sentence in because <laughs> <you've had> <laughs> I didn't know it. I was going to be tested on it yeah. the rest of my life. Yeah. Wow. It really is not about me. It, it's, it's all about God. And I think the rest of my life, I'm going to be working out the implications of that. You know, and just because you write a book doesn't mean you know it all. Mm -hmm. I have to learn stuff that is still, and I, you know, even authors forget what they wrote. And when I wrote this book 20 years ago, and, and interesting, the, the, how it started is it took me seven months to write this book, 12 hours a day. Oh when I was goodness. typing this book, I had no idea that God was going to use it like this. I, I knew it was anointed, but I didn't know it was going to be a bestseller. I knew it was anointed because a lot of times I'd be typing and tears would be flowing down my oh face. My and I'm goodness. going, I am not this good. I, I, I can't say this on my own. This is the Holy Spirit here talking through me. And I knew I was being used different than any other book I've ever written uh, or, or read. And um, when I, before I wrote Purpose Driven Life, I actually asked, uh, how do you get a book to last 500 years? And I went back and I read stuff like Imitation of Christ, which had been around 500 years, and the Desert Fathers, which had been around 500 years. And I thought, how do you do that? And it was to not be, uh, Try, not try to be contemporary. There are almost no stories in this book, which is the exact opposite of what anybody will tell you in writing a book. You gotta tell a lot of good stories. The only stories in it are pretty much biblical stories. Moses did this, or because those are timeless. And when it came out, I had no idea how God was gonna use it, but you know, 20, 20 uh, years later, it's, it's still, uh, still helping people. Ultimately, this book, has to be reimagined almost every generation. Yeah. You were pointing out that yeah. this month's Vogue magazine. Selena yeah. Gomez yeah. is on the cover of Vogue. And, and in, in the interview, in the long cover article on Vogue magazine, said she walked down the stairs with a copy of Purpose Driven Life in her hands and, uh, and her PDL journal and said, I've read through this book three times and, and it's influenced her life. Well, and so. think about it. it. It had just been written when she was born. Yeah, that's true. You know, around the, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, so a, a person who was two years old when the book came out is 22 now. Yeah. So they, they probably want to read the book. Yeah. What a sacrifice. Yeah. What, a, what a seed sown. Yeah. You know, all those days, all that time. It was. All it, that. it really was putting your head down yeah. and focusing. And some of the sweetest days of my communion with the Lord, I've walked to the Lord now for over 50 years. And uh, I can hear his voice. You know, uh, and I want to just say this to people who say, I have a hard time hearing from God. It'll get better. Yeah. Okay, it, it, it will get better. You know, when my wife calls, we've been married 45 years. She doesn't have to say, this is Kay, your wife. <laughs> okay. <laughs> she can breathe. Good, good she can for you. breathe. She goes, ah, and I know it's her. Okay. She doesn't ever have to. My kids, my grandkids yeah. don't have to say, Daddy, this is Josh. Right. Yeah. Okay. Why? I've walked with them so long, I know their tone. Okay. And if you have a hard time hearing from God, it will get better the longer you walk with the Lord. And now there's no doubt in my mind. I, I know now, and this is me talking to myself. Yeah. This is the devil putting the, an idea in my mind. This is the Holy Spirit. You, you know that. Yeah, Dig into that, that just a touch because... Sure. Um, you know, you 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 don't realize you've already started preaching and teaching here, and I love that. But 
what what I what I like about that is, are you talking about the dedication of the time you put into this? Was that what triggered this? Help people understand that this is a phenomenon. So you're kind of telling us how this phenomenon happened. Uh, there's no more fundamental question than why am I alive? Yeah. Okay. What am I here for? Okay, there's the question of existence, why am I alive? There's the question of significance, does my life matter? There's the question of purpose, what am I here for? You don't get any more basic than that. And that itself is a timeless question. Yeah. That, exactly right, yeah. and, and, and they're time. My life verse is David served God's purpose in his generation, then he died. Now, I, I like that verse, I'd like it on my tombstone. He served God's purpose in his generation, then he died. Okay, I don't want to be around here any longer than I have to. I want to be in heaven, yeah. okay? I, I, and the more friends and family I have in heaven, the more I, I long for that. But he, David served God's purpose. That's eternal. Yeah. It never changes. But he did it in his generation. He did it in a contemporary way. It's what you guys are trying to do with TBN. Sure. Yeah. You're trying to do that which never changes in a world that's constantly changing. Beautiful. That which is eternal in a timeless way. That is which is always relevant, but you do it in a relevant way. Serve God's purpose in your generation. Now we can't serve God's purpose in any other generation. Okay. Right. There's some people who think the 1950s was the best right. year of Christianity. And there are people who think the Reformation was the best time of Christianity. But actually, it's when the Bible says in Acts, God chose the times of seasons that we would be born. Mm -hmm. So you and I were meant to live in this generation. The purposes never change. The generation changes all the time. And so it's that tension between the ideal and the real that we have to, have to live with all the time. And when I actually wrote PDL, uh, the first thing I was asking was, how do I say it in the simplest way? Okay, I wasn't trying to be profound. I was trying to be simple. Jesus said profound thoughts in simple ways. Consider the lilies, okay? okay? You know, look at this over here. Very simple. We say simple things in profound ways yeah. and think we're confusing people. <laughs> right. And a lot of times we think we're being deep, but we're just being muddy. You know, it's like, it would be easy for me to confuse people, okay? Right. Jesus said profound things in simple ways. Simple doesn't mean shallow. Simple doesn't mean simplistic. Simple just means it's clear. So I think I wrote PDL basically about a fourth grade level. And that's why it's the most translated book, because it's easy to translate. It, it's not, it, it's straight and to the point. What made you write that? Yeah. Well, I think first, you know, as a pastor for so many years, I've counseled thousands and thousands of people. And I've also stood at the bedside of countless number of people as they took their last breath, okay? And when people are dying and they know they're dying, what they say at the end is often very profound. Yeah. Very, very profound and very important because they're thinking these are my last words on this side of eternity. And I, I kept hearing people talk about purpose, relationships, love, the stuff that really matters. And what I've discovered as a pastor is we eventually figure out what matters most. It just takes us so long, okay? Not a single person that I've been with when they're dying has said, bring me my trophies. <laughs> I want to see my golf trophy. Bring me my diploma. I want to look at it one more time. <laughs> Bring me that gold watch I got from the business I get. No, when people die, you know what they want? They want people around them. They want relationships. And eventually we always learn it's about love. Okay, it's all about love. Now, God has five purposes for our lives. We're not gonna go into all of them, but they're five. You're, you're planned for God's pleasure. You're, you're formed for God's family. You're created to become like Christ. You're uh, shaped to serve God and you're made for a mission. These five purposes are modeled in Acts 2 by the first church. They're explained by Paul in Ephesians 4. Jesus prays for them in uh, John 17. He says, this is the five things I did with the, 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 the disciples. But they're best summarized in the five verbs of the great commandment and the great commission. So if nobody gets anything else that I say right now, this is PDL summarized. 
one day Jesus is walking down the street and a guy comes up and says, Lord, what's the most important command? He goes, oh, that's not rocket science, it's easy. I can summarize all the law and the prophets in two verses, okay? Here's the whole Old Testament, two verses. Uh, love God, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Oh, and by the way, love your neighbors yourself. Okay, now we'll come back to that, but we get two of the purposes of life from the great commandment. Love God with all your heart and love your neighbors yourself. Then right before Jesus went back to heaven, he gives his last words. Last words are important. The very last thing Jesus says is, go make disciples, uh, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teach them to do everything I've commanded you. These three purposes from the Great Commission and two purposes from the Great Commandment are the purposes of life, and they're also the purposes of the church. The purpose of the church is to help you fulfill the five purposes for your life. So what are they? Um, Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. The word for that in the Bible is called worship. Worship is simply expressing love to God. It is the first purpose of my life. My, the Father seeks worshipers. Okay, now I could be expressing love by myself in a quiet time with you in a small group, you and Lori in a small group, or with a thousand people. It's still worship. Anytime I'm expressing love to God, I'm worshiping. Love your neighbor as yourself. The word for that is called ministry or service. The Greek word is diakonia, service, deacon. We get it from that. It means to serve. And when I love God with all my heart and I serve him, that's worship. When I love other people with all my heart and I serve them, that's service or ministry. So we get worship and ministry from the great com commission, commandment. In the great commission, it says, go make disciples, that's, evangelism, we're to tell other people the good news, we're to pass it on. The only reason I'm saved, somebody told me. Right. Okay, somebody told me. So I'm supposed to tell other people. And then it says, teach them to do everything I've told you. That's discipleship. Okay, that's another purpose of my life, to grow in Christ. To become, we're, and, and then in the middle, it says, by the way, baptize them. What's that? Baptism is a symbol that you're part of a family. It's a symbol of fellowship. It says, I'm not just a believer. I'm a belonger. And you guys know, we've heard a lot today, we have hear people say, well, I love Jesus, I just don't need a church. Well, that's like saying I'm a bee, but I don't need a hive. Or, or I'm a football player, but I don't wanna be on any team. Or I wanna be in the army, but not any platoon. Uh, it, 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 a, the Bible says a Christian without a church family is an orphan. And so we're not just believers, we're belongers. And so that's the element of fellowship, that we're better together. So the book's all about all five purposes. The most important one though, and I wanna say it here, is the first one, that your number one purpose in life is to let God love you. Oh my goodness. Not for you to love God, but to let God love you. Now let me explain this. From cover to cover in this book, from Genesis to Revelation, the Bible says that the whole reason the universe exists is God wanted a family. God wanted a family, okay? He didn't need a family. He wasn't lonely. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are in a relationship to themselves in a love relationship, but he wanted a family. The Bible says God is love, not that he has love, that he is love. It's his, his essence, it's his nature, it's his character. The only reason there's any love in the universe is because God created us and he's a God of love. If God was not a God of love, you and I would not have the ability to give and receive love. The only reason we have the ability to give love and receive love is we're made in God's image. Cows don't love, slugs don't love, worms don't love, fish don't love, only created in his image as the ability to love. Now, the Bible says God is love. If I have all this love and I don't bestow it on something, a person, a pet, something, what good is the love? God wanted to show his love, and so he created the universe. And he created a universe just to create this galaxy, just to create this planet, just so it sits on the axis that one degree this way we'd burn up, the one degree this way we'd, turn, we'd freeze up. It's just perfectly designed for human life, just to create the human race, just so we could create Matt and Lori, just so we could love you. Wow. That's beautiful. So 
for those who are, who are listening, you, you gotta realize that if God paid that much attention, the whole universe was created because he wanted to create you so he could love you. If God loves me and I love me, you don't like me, what's your problem? Mm -hmm. Okay, in other words, I, I don't need your approval to be happy. Right. You know what I'm saying? If, yes. if I'm loved by the Father. Yeah. Okay, so what kind of love does God have? What's well, unconditional? God loves you on your good days and on your bad days. He loves you when you feel it and you don't feel it. He loves you when you think you deserve it and when you think you don't deserve it. You can't make God stop loving you. You can try, but you will fail. There's nothing you can do to make God stop loving you because God's love is not based on who you are, it's based on who he is. That's the first purpose, is to let God love me. You were planned for God's pleasure. People go, why am I made? I'll tell you why you're made. God made you to love you. If he had wanted to love you, you would not exist. God made you to love you. Now, where in the world is that message not needed? This is why the book keeps selling because it, it is the fundamental issue of life. Why am I here? I'm here to be loved by God. And the Bible says we love him because he first loved us. Our love's a response. We don't start with loving God. People tell me all the time, you know, pastor, you know, I think my problem is I don't love God enough. And I say, no, that's not your problem. Your problem is not that you don't love God enough. Your problem is you don't really feel and understand how much he loves you. Because if you really understood and felt how much God loves you, you can't help but love him, yeah. okay? It's not a duty. Yeah. It, it's just I have to love somebody who loves me that much. And so I start with the first purpose of living in God's love, letting God love me, and then learning to love him back, and that's called worship. There was, a, there was an unfulfilled question in the heart, I believe. This is my opinion, uh, you know, maybe, maybe it wasn't, but it felt like, on CNN, it, uh -huh. was, it felt like Larry King, uh -huh. since he shot his show yeah. in Los Angeles, yeah. you were often on it. Right. And more times than not, yeah. he doesn't matter what the subject that you were there I to deal with. I know where you're with. going. <laughs> <laughs> if God is love, right. why do bad things yeah. happen to yeah. good people? Yeah. Well, let, let me just, that's a great question, Matt. And I'm so glad you're asking it because when you look at these five purposes, knowing Christ in worship, loving Christ, growing in Christ, serving Christ, sharing Christ, I, there's lots of different ways to say these five purposes, worship, fellowship, discipleship, ministry, evangelism. And God uses problems and pain to build all five purposes in our lives. My goodness. Okay, now, you would know in your own life, if I asked you, Lori, when have your times of worship been closer to God? In pain. Mm -hmm. When you felt the heat on, both of you, when you felt like we're misunderstood, we're, uh, we're being criticized, uh, we, things are not going the way we want them to, uh, the finances aren't there, whatever it is, those are your deepest times of worship. Yeah. Not God, C.S. Lewis said, God whispers to us in our pleasure and shouts to us in our pain. Mm. Wow. Pain is God's megaphone. Yeah. So God uses pain to deepen our worship. God uses pain to deepen our fellowship. Uh, it, it, when I'm, I don't grow close to you by bragging to you. I grow close to you when I tell you where I'm hurting and then it draws us close. I've been in a small group with uh, some other couples in Southern California for 18 years. We've been through um, uh, deaths in the family, cancer, job loss, suicide, you, you name it, uh, all kinds of different problems. And we're, we actually are closer together. My wife and I are closer together after losing our son to mental illness than we were before because the pain actually drew us closer together. And maybe we could talk about that a little bit because purpose doesn't prevent you from pain. Mm -hmm. Let me say that again. Purpose does not prevent you from pain, okay? You're gonna have pain in your life. Um, and it's actually part 
of the purpose. And then um, in, in growth, we grow through pain. Romans chapter eight talks about how we grow through pain. We be, if God's gonna make me like Jesus Christ, and that's his number one goal, to make me like Christ, he's gonna take me through everything Jesus went through. Wow. Were there times when Jesus was lonely? Yes. Misunderstood? Yes. Criticized? Yes. Discouraged? Yes. Were there times when he was tempted? Yes. Every one of those things. Why would God take his son through those things and not take me? The Bible says Jesus learned obedience through suffering. The Bible says Jesus was made perfect through suffering. Well, how do you, I think I'm gonna learn those things? Same way, okay? So it's not a lack of faith, it's part of discipleship. So God uses pain to deepen my worship, to deepen my fellowship. He uses pain to deepen my spiritual growth. There's some things we only learn through pain. And then God uses pain to give us a ministry uh, to serve others. Your greatest ministry will likely come out of your deepest hurt. Wow. Okay, your greatest ministry will likely come out of your deepest hurt. If you'll be honest to God, honest to yourself, and honest with others to share it. So you have said pain yeah. causes growth. Yeah. Those are, you have to own those words yes, too. Yes, I have. Okay. What? is the most painful event in the 20 years in your life and mm -hmm. how do these words yeah. help you through that? Yeah, well, I would have said uh, until Matthew's death, uh, Kay's cancer. Uh, and it, Kay got cancer uh, right after I, I wrote this book. And honestly, when, in the early years when this book was selling a million copies every other month, uh, Honestly, the last thing I was thinking of is, oh, this is great, I'm on the cover of Time Magazine. I'm, think, I'm holding the bedpan while my wife throws up and her hair's falling out, and I'm going, am I gonna be alone with three kids? And, and Kay wrote a book one time uh, called Choose Joy, and on it, it's a pair of railroad tracks, and this goes to your point, in that I used to think that we had good times and bad times and that life was like mountains and valleys. Okay, you have high mountain tops and you have low valleys. But the truth is, life is more like a pair of railroad tracks where you get both at the same time. My goodness. The good and the bad are constantly. And no matter how good things are in your life, there's always something bad you gotta be working on, okay? And no matter how bad things are in your life, there's always something you can be thankful for, you can be grateful for. Wow. My son, my youngest son, Matthew, struggled with mental illness his entire life. He was born as a, as a child. We could see he was clinically depressed as a child. And I remember when he was 17 years old, he came to me in tears. He loved the Lord. He had a tender heart, a tortured mind. Tender heart, tortured mind. He led people to Christ. He gave my book out to people. He would witness to people on suicide sites. He said, Dad, it just doesn't work for me. I just can't get the depression out. And when at 17, he came to me and he said, Dad, it's real obvious I'm not gonna be healed. He said, We've, we, we have gone to the best doctors. I've had the best medicine. Dad, I, I've gone to the best healers, men of faith, women of faith. I said, Dad, you're a man of faith. Mom is a woman of faith. You've prayed for me, intercessors. Uh, I've gone to the best counselors. He said, it's real clear, I'm not gonna get well. Why can't I just die and go on to heaven? I know where I'm going. Why can't I just go on? I, I just don't want the pain anymore. That'll break your heart as a father, okay, to have your son, and in tears, I'm standing there flooding tears down my face, and I said, Matthew, I, I don't think you wanna die. I just think you wanna be over the pain. You want relief. And I said, here's my prayer. One, I will never stop praying for a miracle because miracles do happen. As a pastor, I've seen thousands of miracles, physical miracles. I've seen many, many miracles. So I know they happen. But because they're miracles, because they don't always happen, not every time. Uh, and so sometimes it doesn't. And, and I said, my prayer is, A, you'll be miraculously cured, okay? And I will never stop praying for that. And I do have a prayer ministry. And number two, though, if not, I pray that through your own spiritual growth and maturity, good counselor, good medication, you'll be able to manage 
Because Matthew, the truth is on this earth, not everything gets healed. This is hev not heaven, this is earth. In heaven, there's no more sadness, sorrow, sickness, suffering. But he said, there's pain here on earth. And that's why we are to pray in the Lord's Prayer, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Because in heaven, God's will is done perfectly, completely, instantly, and continuously. On earth, none of that's true. I often don't do God's will. You often don't do God's will. Other people, and so we hurt people intentionally, unintentionally, and there is, everything is broken on this planet. By sin, uh, the weather's broken, the economy's broken, our bodies are broken, our minds are broken, everything's, we live in a broken planet. And that's why the Bible says in Romans, creation groans for the day of, of salvation. So I said, what do you do when a problem can't be solved? And there, if I have a child who has cerebral palsy, that child's gonna have it the rest of its life, most likely. In those kind of things, you have to manage the problem. And some problems aren't miracles, some problems are managed for the glory of God. Johnny gave glory to God without a miracle, has done her entire life, Right. okay? And many others have done that too, who've lived with thorns in the flesh. And they gave glory to God either through a miracle or through managing it. Either way, God gets glory. So my prayer is that you'll be able to manage it and then God will give you a ministry of helping other people. Hmm. Well, uh, about eight years ago, Matthew'd come over to our house for uh, dinner one night and we had a good time. We watched TV, played a few games. There's no problem, no rift. He lived in his own home. As he was leaving, he said, Dad, I'm just so tired. I'm, I'm so tired. And that was the last we heard from him. Wow. So about 24 hours later, we are worried because what we'd feared might happen someday and what we would pray would never happen. We go over to his house. His car's in the driveway, the door's locked. We don't have a key to get into his house. And we're waiting for the police to come break down the door to find this terrible moment in our lives. And Kay and I are standing on the driveway, hugging each other, sobbing, just sobbing. And Kay reaches down and she's wearing a necklace that has two words that are the words of the title of the book she'd just written, Choose Joy. And I look at her and I say, how do you choose joy when your heart is breaking in a million pieces? How do you choose joy? The police came, broke the door down, found the, the inevitable bad news. They're carrying my sons out in a body bag. And I, if I hadn't had a small group, I, I don't know that I'd still be in ministry right now, but that, that group that I'd been in for so many years, those couples showed up within 30 minutes, 15, 20 minutes on that driveway. And they didn't say anything. They just hugged us, okay? They just hugged us. And, and they said, we're not going to leave you alone tonight. The guys hugged the, me and the women hugged Kay. They said, we're coming to your house. You don't have to say anything. We're, we're just going to be with you. Now, this is an important thing I want to say to those of you who are watching. I teach this to pastors all around the world. The deeper the pain, the fewer words you use. This is an important thing to remember. The deeper the pain, the fewer words you use. If somebody's having a bad hair day, you can have a 30 minute you know, conversation, yeah. Yeah. okay? But if somebody's just lost a son to suicide, you show up and shut up. There's nothing you can say. It's the ministry of presence. People say, I don't know what to say. Don't say anything. Just show up and shut up. That is the ministry of presence. Now, let me go back to when I said how God uses in every purpose. Out of that pain came, the, for the next 16 weeks, I spent it alone with God. I was either with Kay or with God. I didn't do any preaching, no staff meeting, n nothing, for 16 weeks. I had all my buddies, okay, uh, Judah Smith and uh, Judd Wilhite and uh, all, I had 60, Greg Laurie, all came in and preached for me for 16 weeks, okay? 
and I was either with Cod or with Kay and just listening. I received during that time, I'm not exaggerating, maybe 30, 35,000 letters of condolences. And the ones that meant the most to me, honestly, Matt, were not the ones from rock stars and presidents and prime ministers. They, they wrote me, many, many people that I didn't know wrote me and gave great condolences. The ones that meant the most to me were people that Matthew had led to Christ. Oh my goodness. And they said, I know that Matthew struggled with mental illness his entire life, but he led me to faith. And I'm gonna be in heaven because of him. And he was talking to me on a suicide site. And he talked me out of it. And I'm gonna be in heaven because of him. And I remember writing in my journal that day, in God's garden of grace, even broken trees bear fruit. My goodness. And then I wrote, and we're all broken. Okay, we're, we're all broken, okay. So if you think that reading Purpose Driven Life is gonna give you a perfect life, don't even bother. It will give you a life of purpose and it will help you understand how God uses all these things. And the fifth thing was God uses pain to be a witness. I, I actually think that our greatest witness to the world is how we handle pain. Not how we handle good times. There's a guy I've been witnessing to on my block for 20 years and he was not interested in anything. He just shut down, closed. But when Matthew died, I remember driving by one day and he's out watering his lawn and he looks up at me and he goes, and I'm going, that got to him, that got to him. And all of a sudden it was real. And he was watching how I was handling the worst circumstances of my life. And so, as I say, your greatest ministry will come out of your deepest pain. I say that from experience. There's not a week go by that somebody famous calls me with either a mental illness issue or a suicide issue. And I'm talking about from the highest of the highest people, personalities in politics and in celebrity. And Kay and I did not ask for this ministry of ministering to families with mental illness and ministering to families struggling with suicide of a family member. I didn't want that ministry, but it's one that God gave us. And I'm not gonna waste the pain. So I would say to everybody, whatever your pain is, have you been molested? My wife was molested as a little girl in a church. She has used that pain to help others, okay? Uh, cancer, I, 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 don't, you're gonna go through pain in life, just don't waste it. If you're gonna go through pain, you might as well use it to help somebody else out. You know, um, I don't know who you are, where you came from or what your background is, but I do know this, you matter to God, you matter to God. A and the reason that you exist is God made you to love you. He made you to love you. If he hadn't wanted to love you, you wouldn't exist. And if God were to say to you today these words, he would say, I thought you up, I formed you in your mother's womb. I have watched every day of your life, the good days, the bad days, the ups and downs, the highs, lows, and I have never, never stopped loving you. And all of the pain that you've gone through, I have wept. The Bible says God cries. I have wept at the pains that you have gone through. And I have waited for this day and I, I want you to know me. We're not talking about religion. We're talking about a personal relationship. I made you for a friendship. You know, I am a friend of God. I have walked with him now for over 50 years. I know his voice. I know his touch. And I know that no matter what I face in the future, I'll handle it because God is with me. And he's never not with me. Have you ever thought that maybe the pain you're going through right now is to get your attention? 
and for God to say to you, I'm standing here waiting for you, but he's a gentleman. He doesn't come into your life until you invite him in. You say, what will happen if I open my life to the love of Jesus Christ? Three things will happen in your life. Past, present, future. First, your past forgiven. Second, purpose for living. Third, a home in heaven. Past forgiven, purpose for living, home in heaven. Who else can offer that to you? Nobody, nobody. You were made by God and you were made for God. Until you understand that, life will never make sense. The purpose of your life is not your career. The purpose of your life is not your family. The purpose of your life is not your hobbies. Those are all good things. They're all gifts of God. But what the purpose of your life is, is to let God love you and to learn to love him back. You say, what do I do? You just be honest. It really doesn't matter the words you say as much as a humble attitude that says, God, I need you. There was a guy who came to Jesus one time who had a daughter who needed to be healed. And he said, Lord, I need you to heal my daughter. And Jesus said, well, do you believe I can heal her? And he said, Lord, I, I want to believe. Help me with my unbelief. Jesus said, that's good enough. And he healed her right on the spot. I wish somebody had told me years ago that I didn't have to have all my questions answered in order to open up my life to Jesus Christ. I didn't have to have all of my excuses fulfilled and all of my reasons and rationales answered I just had to take a simple step of faith. Lord, I want to believe. Help me with my doubts. I've walked with the Lord now all these many, many years. There's still things in this book I don't understand. And I go, wow, I don't know that I would have done it that way if I was God. Thank God I'm not God. His ways are not my ways. But I don't have to understand the chemistry of digestion to eat a steak and enjoy it. And, and I don't have to understand how internal combustion works to drive a car. I don't even have to understand how right now TV waves are going through the air and going right through my body, and you're seeing this. But it doesn't keep me from benefiting from it. So I'm going to ask you to make a simple step of faith right now, and that is to lay aside all the doubts and all the questions. We'll work on those, and there are legitimate answers to those. But to take a simple step, say, Lord, I want to believe. Help me with my doubt. Help me with my doubt. One night, many, many years ago, in a cabin in Northern California at a Christian camp, I was working as the lifeguard at a Christian camp. And I walked into that cabin at night, and I got down on my knees, and I prayed a simple prayer, something like this. And I said, God, if there is a God, I want to know you. And if you can give me a better life than I'm living right now, I want it. I want it. Yeah, I'd like to go to heaven, but I really would like a better life right now. And so as much as I know how, I open my life to you, and I say, yes, yes, I'm giving you a blank check, and I'm signing my name. You fill in the amount. And for the rest of my life, I will live for you, and I'll love you, and I'll learn to serve you because you made me, you saved me, you have a purpose for my life, you want me with you forever. The whole reason I exist is because of your love. And you know, when I prayed that simple prayer, you know what happened? Nothing. <laughs> I didn't actually feel any different. No angels came down, no wings fluttered, no blinding light. My hair didn't turn white like Charlton Heston, but that was the turning point in my life. And that simple decision changed the rest of my life. It's kind of like one day I stood in front of a bunch of people and I said two words that changed my life. I said them to my wife. I said, I do. Two words, I do. When I said those two words, I had no idea what I was doing. And the rest of my life, for 45 years, I've been working out the implications of two words, I do. <laughs> it's like, that's in the fine print, and Kay will say, yeah, that's part of the I do. Oh, okay, that's in the idea? Yeah, okay, then I do that too. I do too. 
You don't have to understand it all right now. You just have to take a little bit of faith. You say, well, I don't have any faith. Yeah, you do. When you sit down in a chair, you have faith that the chair will hold you up. You drive a car, you have a faith that you can drive. You use faith every moment of your life. It's what you put it in. So take that little faith right now, and I'm going to lead you in a simple prayer. It's going to change your life, not just for the rest of your life, but for all of eternity. All right? You don't even have to close your eyes. You can look at me right now. I'll look at you and you look at me, okay? Just say these words. Dear God, say that in your life. Dear God, as much as I know how, I invite Jesus Christ into my life. I don't understand it all, but I know I need you. And I want to get to know you. And I want to learn to trust you. And I want to know your purpose for my life. Why am I here? And what do you want to do with my life? And I'm saying, yes, Lord, that's my answer, even before you ask the question. Yes. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for dying for me. I want to give my life completely to you. In your name, I pray this. Now, if you prayed that prayer just now, the Bible says in the book of Romans, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now, would God lie? No, God, God isn't capable. People say, "What is there anything God can do? Yes, there's some things God can do. God cannot lie. And if he says, I will save you if you call on my name, did you call on his name? If you followed me in that prayer, you just called on his name. Then according to scripture, no matter what you feel, high, low, or whatever, you've been brought into the kingdom of God. You brought into the family of God. You're a child of God. You were always loved by him. You were created by him, but now you're in his family. You know what the first thing you need is a family? You need to find a family home. You need to get a church. There are lots of good churches in your area. If you don't have one, well, call TBN, or call, look up Saddleback. We'll help you find one in your area to, to find a place. And the number one thing you need as a new Christian is a family. They'll help you get all the other stuff in your life. But I will be praying for you. Matt and Lori, you guys will be praying for them. Absolutely. And this is the most important decision you've ever made. Now, let me just say this. Sometimes there's a little bit of delayed reaction. I remember when I said those words to my wife, I do, and I got married. And I remember I woke up the next morning after our wedding night, and I rolled over in bed and I looked at my wife, and I said to Kay, my new wife, so I said, you know, I don't feel very married. <laughs> <laughs> she said, well, it doesn't matter whether you feel like it or not, Buster, you're married. Okay, you made a commitment, you are married. Okay, well, uh, it was about two weeks later, I was actually at the end of the honeymoon, I remember waking up one morning and I rolled over in bed and I looked at Kay laying there and I go, I get this woman to be my wife for the rest of my life. And I, I got so excited about it, I got out of bed, they started jumping around. And I go, I'm married, I'm married, I'm married. She goes, well, a little delayed reaction, but at least you got it. So the emotions can come now or they can come later. But when God comes into your life, he starts making changes. God bless you. At TBN, our mission is to use every available means to reach as many individuals and families as possible with the life-changing gospel of Jesus Christ. Thank you for helping make the gospel of grace go around the world. Without you, we couldn't do it. God bless you.